Can you catch someone's microbiome? Scientists are finding that our social networks help determine which microbes live in and on our bodies. But how important is the social transmission of microbiome members? And what does it mean for human health and disease? Welcome to Microbial Minutes, the American Society for Microbiology's update on what's hot in microbial sciences. I'm Madeline Barron, Science Communication Specialist at ASM. Before we dive into today's video, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the description. It only takes a few minutes and helps us make better videos. We appreciate your support. It is well known that our microbiome, particularly our gut microbiome, plays a pivotal role in keeping our bodies healthy. On the flip side, alterations in the community are associated with susceptibility to infection and diverse diseases. With that, the factors that shape the microbiome are vast and varied. Diet, genetics, medication, exercise, and many others influence the composition and diversity of the community. One factor that has been relatively underexplored, though is getting more attention among researchers, is the role of social interactions. That is, what your microbiome looks like likely has something to do with the people you know, and maybe even those you don't. Now that microbes can spread between people is not breaking news. We are familiar with microbial transmission in the context of infectious disease when pathogens move from person to person and cause sickness. However, all sorts of microbes, including many non-pathogenic organisms found in people's microbiomes, can also spread through direct or indirect contact. We know, for instance, that microbes are transmitted from mothers to babies during and after birth. But our lives encompass many different types of relationships beyond those we have with our parents, especially as we grow up. And yet this facet of microbial transmission has received less attention compared to studies on how pathogens move through social networks. Getting those insights is valuable, though, as they could have a considerable impact on individual and collective health. With that, scientists are trying to get a feel for how much microbial sharing happens, how it happens, and what we can learn about social relationships by looking at people's microbiomes. A recent study published in Nature provided some clues to answer these questions. In this study, researchers mapped face-to-face -face social networks among over 1,700 people in 18 isolated villages in Honduras. They identified different, often overlapping, relationships between individuals ranging from a partner or spouse to someone an individual engages in personal or private conversations with. The scientists then sequenced the microbiomes of the study cohort and assessed the rate in which people shared the same species and strains, that is, specific genetic variants or subtypes, of gut microbes. They found that a relationship between people, no matter the type, increased the likelihood that individuals had shared species and strains of microbes in their guts. More time spent together equated to more sharing, regardless of whether people were related or lived in the same house. This checks out as more time together means more opportunities to spread microbes directly or indirectly. In fact, having a relationship tie was more associated with strain sharing than similarities based on other factors like diet or taking the same medications and wealth. While strain sharing was highest for first degree connections, such as a spouse, it also extended to second degree connections, for example, a friend of a friend, indicating that someone's broader social network is also important. In fact, the scientists could actually look at microbial strains found in individuals' microbiomes and use computer modeling to predict reasonably well if those people had a relationship tie with one another, including non-kin relationships and those among people in different households. The predictions were strengthened when other factors like age, education, living in the same house, and others were integrated into the model, which makes sense given all those things shape an individual and how they engage with others but that the scientists could predict relationships at all from the microbiome is pretty notable. The study results further highlighted that someone's position within a social network mattered too. Compared to those on the social periphery, people who were more socially central, or popular, so to speak, had higher rates of strain sharing with the village as a whole versus any one of their social connections. As such, the authors suggest that how gregarious or reserved someone is could influence the composition of their gut microbial community. Other work has found signs of social microbial transmission not just in the gut, but in other body regions like the skin and the mouth. And what all these findings suggest is that social microbial transmission beyond the spread of pathogens is happening, and it's something to investigate more deeply. As the researchers of this study note, the results may prove the case that groups of interconnected people might share phenotypes not only because of shared genes or transmitted behaviors, but also because of shared microbes. 
This gets to the crux of why this topic warrants further exploration, which is that the social transmission of microbiome members could have an important, if somewhat unclear, impact on health. A recent review article on the topic highlighted that socially transmissible microbes could affect processes like how well someone's microbiome can resist colonization or growth of pathogens by promoting microbiome diversity and stability, or facilitating transfer of microbes that are specifically important for colonization resistance. Microbial sharing could also influence how resilient the microbiome is to disturbances like antibiotic treatment. There's also a possibility that microbes with beneficial roles in immune and metabolic function are passed among individuals, as was demonstrated in macaques, whereby bacterial genera with beneficial health effects were positively associated with sociability, whereas species associated with negative effects, such as streptococcus, were more common in less sociable individuals. In such cases, sociability bolsters collective health. This review further notes that socially transmitted microbes may also represent a communicable component to conditions that are considered non-communicable, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, or cancer. And we know that the microbiome is associated with a whole slew of conditions, and even with responses to drugs used to treat those conditions. But is it possible that among other factors, the microbial underpinnings of social relationships are involved in their development or even their prevention? Indeed, the hazy ties between the transfer of gut microbes and potential disease is one of the outstanding questions behind procedures like fecal microbiota transplants, in which gut microbes are intentionally transferred from one host to another, and researchers are working to better understand this risk. In a social context, there is evidence that certain phenotypes may have social microbial links. For example, over the years, studies have shown that the gut microbiome is associated with obesity. Moreover, social relationships and interactions appear to play some underlying role in obesity risk and development, though why that is the case is not well defined. Could there be a microbial piece? Experiments in mice suggest there could be. In a seminal 2013 study, animals harboring microbiota from a lean individual were co-housed with those harboring a microbiota from the individual's twin with obesity. Transfer of gut microbiomes from the former group, that is the mice with the lean twins microbiota, prevented an increase in body mass index and obesity-related metabolic phenotypes in the latter group, though in a diet-dependent fashion. The diet component indicates there is more than just microbes coming into play here and in all aspects of health, though there could be a transmissible piece worth considering. Researchers have also found evidence for the effects of social microbial transmission in the context of other conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, as well as for improving responses to immune checkpoint blockade therapy for cancer. Across the board, however, more human studies are needed to disentangle the functional impacts of social microbial transmission, as most work has been done in animals. The bottom line is that as we go about our lives, we are swapping microbes with one another not just the ones with overt impacts on how we feel and that lead to infections, but also those with more covert, but maybe critical, parts to play. The more we understand this social microbial transmission, the more we can potentially leverage it to promote the well-being of everyone in our social circles. That's all for today. References for today's episode are linked in the description. And if you liked this video, be sure to subscribe to ASM's YouTube channel to get more microbial minutes. As always, I want to thank you for listening, thank Ray Ortega for production, and I'll talk to you next time.